Okay, environmental methodologist, uh, part three of my summary of statistics for this course, a sampler of sampling methods. So what I'm going to give you here is uh, a sampler. It's not, it's not complete. I mean, if you really wanted to get a complete understanding of sampling methods, you would probably take an ecology course or maybe an advanced ecology course that was focused on sampling, really. I have actually taught an entire semester work semester's worth of sampling methods it there's a lot of ways to do it and i just wanted in this case since it's super important to environmental methods to know something about sampling just give you sort of a taste of some of the diversity of methods out there so without further ado here we go um uh, the first thing to understand is uh, that, well, there is census and there's sampling, and you need to understand the term census. The definition of census is that it is a complete count of a population. And shown here is a creosote bush. These, each dot here is a unique, um, the larger dots are creosote bushes. The smaller dots might be some other kind of shrub. And uh, these are a crazy plant that uh, they, they're able to suppress seedling germination within a radius underneath them and so what that results in is a very even distribution of plants across the land and um, if you wanted to you could go out there and easily count them first you need to define your population and if for instance i said my population is all the creosote bushes uh, within this area right here i could go and do a complete count probably and that would be the definition of a census but pretty quickly you find that there's not many things of interest out there that can be completely counted and especially in conservation biology when you get to the point where you can do a complete count on a species like a say a Cal california condor you're pretty close to extinction and about ready to throw in the towel um let's say i was interested in counting all the creosote bushes in eureka valley california well, look at them all. There's a lot. How much time and money do I have? Probably not that much. And so pretty soon I would have to abandon the census technique and go to sampling. <clears throat> so I have some general comments about sampling. I, I would do sampling to develop an estimate of the total population. That's in fact, hopefully what you have been doing in lab lately. So some general comments about sampling. The particular techniques depend in large part on the question being asked. Well, what kind of questions can you ask? Um, well, in this class, I very frequently emphasize a very simple question. How many individuals are in a population? How many redwood trees are in the Arcata community forest? How many sword ferns are in the Arcata community forest? How many grains of rice are in my bag of Mahatma brand white rice? Um, again, I have to define the population, and that's my question, how many individuals are in there? But actually, there are some other questions you can ask which are very simple, uh, similar, but not exactly the same. An analogous question might be, how much of a substance is in the air, or in the water, or your food? How much of something is somewhere? That is the general question um, often addressed in sampling. So I, 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 maybe I'm overthinking this, but I really like to boil this down to the simplest phrase. And it might be something like, how much or how many of something is somewhere of interest? Just ponder over those phrases and see if they make sense to you. They should. Here's some examples. Um, a forester might ask, how many trees are here? This is a picture of uh, someplace in the White Mountains of California, and each dot there is a bristlecone pine tree. And a forester, or they don't actually practice forestry there because they don't; those trees are protected, I think. Um, but let's say it were a, 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 <clears throat> a market-based kind of lumber, like Douglas fir or redwood, and you were a forester. If it was your land and you wanted to make some money off it by harvesting the trees, you'd want to know how many trees are here. You want to get a population estimate of the trees on your property. Uh, alternatively, climate scientists, how much methane is released by US fracking operations? So what is the population? I guess that would be um, the methane released by all the United States fracking operations. And what would your sample be? 
Well, it wouldn't, there's no individuals to measure there, but you could measure a quantity of gas. So you might have sensors around fracking operations or across the United States that are sniffing methane and they can give you an answer. There's so much methane per cubic liter or something like that. How about in conservation biology? How many Humboldt Martins are alive? This species was thought to have been extinct until it showed up in a wildlife camera and they're like, oh my God, they're not extinct. So then the question is, well, how many Humboldt Martins are there in the whole world? Uh, an epidemiologist might say, how many people in your county currently have COVID-19? Okay, the population is people in the county, and the question is how many are COVID-19 COVID positive? Okay, so all these questions, you can see um, there's, there's so many questions. Almost every environmental question um, at the very basis has estimating something at its base. And so that's why I emphasize sampling in this class because it's a really important method. So now, aside from obtaining a single estimate of some parameter from a single population, there are many other reasons that sampling might be used. So instead of just like how many Martins are left or how many people are COVID positive, there's some other questions that you might want to put sampling to use with for. For instance, are two or more populations different in size from each other? Well, once you figured out how to make an estimate for one population, you can do it for two populations and then you can compare them. Super important at its fundamental base, at its foundation is sampling. Is there a relationship between some factor and population size? Uh, so I don't know, take two factors of something. Um, I don't know. Uh, how far an animal can run in a day? Uh, and is there a relationship between species like zebras and horses? Um, that's not a good example. Some factor in population size. Oh, I don't know. Uh, there's burrows in the mountains of the Great Basin and there's horses in the Great Basin. Do they have the same population or different size? size? Okay, how about another example? If I treat a population one way and another population another way, will that affect some measurable parameter? So I have to measure the parameter of one population and get another population and treat them differently and see if my treatment had an effect. I'm still going to have to sample both populations and measure that factor. And I'm going to have to use sampling to figure that out unless I can count every single one. Okay. So, you can use sampling to answer a lot of questions, not just how many of something is somewhere, but also experimental stuff. So um, we'll consider what I just said soon when we focus on statistical tests of significance. So when you want to compare two populations, there's a way to do that, but I'm not getting into that here. The important lesson here is that regardless of the question, when using sampling, the rules that you have already been taught always apply. And those rules are, just to review, the method must be replicable. That means not that you do it twice, that is you replicate it, but um, it, you have to convince someone that you've described it so well that it could be replicated. So for instance, they discovered a gravity wave using a very complicated thingamabob. They didn't do it twice, but they couldn't have published their results unless they convinced everybody that you could do it twice if you followed their procedures. So the method must be replicable. Second, it must include repeated measures or multiple samples to assess variation. Uh, you know, that gravity wave did not have repeated measures. Actually, I think there were two. There was two, um, two gizmos on opposite sides of the planet that measured the gravity wave at the same time. Not my area of expertise. So I just want to tell you guys, make sure you understand this first one, what it means. I just described it. Make sure you understand it. Regarding this second one here, you'll often hear that um, repeated measures are called replicates. So if you go into a forest and put a quadrat down here and a quadrat down here, those are repeated measures. I measured here and I measured here and I measured 15 times. Uh, and then I did some math um, to assess variation. 
some people call that replicate measuring. It's so bad English. I mean, it's English. We use those terms, but it's terribly unfortunate because then people think replicability and replication are the same thing. And so the meaning of those words can freaking overlap in people's heads and confuse them. Don't be confused. Make sure you understand the difference between these two bulleted points here. Lastly, these repeated measures must be obtained from random sampling to avoid bias, right? Truly random sampling. That means the position of where you sampled was determined by a random number generator, not by you throwing something off to the side or thinking, oh, this is just random because this is just random is not just random because your brain subconsciously has all kinds of bias. So um, anyway, make sure you understand these three components of statistical tests. Definitely question, test question material. Okay. Now, so I just wanted to give you some sampling, some examples of sampling methods used to generate simple population estimates. Randomly distributed quadrats. What's a quadrat? Well, quadrats can assume different shapes. Typically, they're square, and, and so they're an area of size, and they can be small, very small, or like as small as a microscopic slide, or they can be very large. Depends on your organism. Um, so what you do is you randomly sample. So you have quadrats, many quadrats per population sampled, not just one, because that would be violating a requirement. Um, <clears throat> so you uh, distribute them across the landscape randomly, and you'd make your counts in each quadrat. You know, have a known area of what the quadrat is. So then you calculate the average number of organisms per quadrat or per unit area, then you multiply that by the total area of your population. You do a railroad track formula and you can come up with an estimate for your population. Make sure you understand that. You're probably, many of you are probably doing something like that in lab. I say this is easily said, it's not so easily done. It's usually very difficult in, a, in natural populations to go out there and um, distribute quadrats randomly across the landscape. Even within a quadrat, it's time consuming to make the count. Then it's time consuming to go to different places and set them up. Um, the methods might be tricky to make replicable. Um, and maybe you don't even know the total area of your population, but you, that's what G, GSP people are for. Anyway, I, I say it's easily said, not so easily done. Uh, maybe someday you probably will when you take ESM 303. If you do, you will be doing something like this um, and you'll find out just exactly how uh, energy intensive it can be. Um, but uh, quadrats don't have to be square or circular or even they don't have to be an area, a two-dimensional shape. They could be a three-dimensional shape. Here's some examples of other uh, sample designs. Um, you can have a volume of water. I'm going to give you an example in a moment of what I mean by that. But basically, uh, well, if you wanted to figure out how many krill and little shrimp-like organisms are in a cubic meter of water, you'd want to sample a volume of water and get all the krill out of it and count them. Length of a pine branch. I had some students measure the number of pine needles on a length of a pine branch. That was their sample size. Not a quadrat, but a good uh, kind of a sample. Let's say you're a miner and you wonder like how much gold or silver is in this particular ore. Well, you want to know what the concentration is. You're not just going to do it once because that would be violating the principles of sampling. You would take multiple samples randomly distributed within an area of interest and crush it up and do chemical tests to figure out the concentration of ore. That would be your sample. Um, in atmospheric testing, I've mentioned before, like gas concentrations. Okay, so um, the principles all apply. Multiple sampling, random distribution, replicability. So the thing about quadrat-based sampling is that it relies on the ability to count all individuals or organi all individual organisms or to measure concentration, whatever you're doing, within the quadrat, within the sample. So it relies on the ability to actually do the count within the sample. You can't always do that because um, it works well for plants or barnacles or other sessile organisms. That's an ecological term, which means something that stays in place and doesn't move around. 
Uh, so here's some plants, here's a quadrat, and you can easily see the plants and count them. Um, here's a marine example where they're probably counting, I don't know, some sessile organism. But um, it does not work so good for very small things that you can't see, or mobile things, things that run away when you put a thing down on top of them, or when you even show up, or cryptic things, things that hide well. Cryptic, like in a crypt, they're hiding. So what do you do for them? I just want to say something. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but this came across my desk recently. Um, JG stands for Jolly Giant, and it turns out that many entities locally here in Humboldt County are concerned about water quality. Locally, we've got the city of Arcata. We have certain streams running through the town, and the city of Arcata has an environmental services department They're in charge of the environment of Arcata. They're responsible for it. And the, the staff there are concerned with um, pollution in that water. We want it to be <clears throat> as pollution-free as possible. And there's NGOs, non-government organizations like uh, the Humboldt Baykeepers. And, and there's federal agencies and state agencies too that monitor water quality all around. So um, some local coalition of these people did some testing of fecal coliform and enterococci. These are bacteria that get in the water. They, they're associated with human waste. Not just human waste, also dog waste and bird waste and worm waste. Um, but they're definitely associated with human waste. And so we want to find out how much of this stuff is in Jolly Giant Creek. And so what they did is they sampled eight different locations. This was not a random sampling because they weren't interested in figuring out the average concentration of fecal coliforms in all of Jolly Giant Creek. They're just more interested in like, what's the concentration at each one of these spots? What's the count there? They wanted to develop a population or they wanted to be able to develop a population estimate of bacteria at each of these spots because maybe some are worse than others and that could give them a clue as to where contamination, if it exists, happens. Great, but two problems, one tiny, one large. The tiny one is whoever put this together didn't close their parentheses. They need another parentheses here. That's the first sign that maybe this wasn't done very carefully. It makes me look a little bit more carefully, which is a sign to you guys when you're doing work, make sure you proofread it carefully. Because when you have simple English errors like that, you're signaling to your teacher or that whoever is evaluating your work that maybe you did some sloppy work and they should look a little bit closer. Okay, that's a small problem. The bigger problem is what do they actually do here? I don't know. Um, I have made inquiries because I am concerned that each location was sampled one time and they developed a most probable number per mil, MPN stands for most probable number. It's a measure of numbers uh, per mil. Um, if they went to Jolly Giant Creek site one and took out one sample of water and then did whatever it takes to count the MPN, I have a problem with these results. And I, why you should also have a problem with these results because if this is a single sample it has violated the principles of sampling this is if i base my estimate on jolly giant creek site one on a single sample then i'm assuming that all the water at that place in time had the exact same concentration of bacteria is that a safe assumption no, it's not a safe assumption until you've determined it's a safe assumption. You have to multiply sample that spot. It could be that down low, up high, off to the side, that there's a non-homogeneous -homo non mix of bacteria in that location. The solution, multiple samples in each location. Okay, that was a tangent. It reminds you of important sampling methodology. But it also, it's an example of a volumetric sample instead of a quadrat sample. But sometimes it's hard to set up quadrats. And I just want to let you know briefly that sometimes um, ecologists, people sampling, will set up a transect. You may have heard of this. You may see it someday. If you take ESM 303, you indeed will do transects. Um, a transect is basically you set up a line across your population. And what do you do along that line? It varies. There's multiple different approaches. Off to the right here, you can see that um, it looks like they set up a transect from the lake 
uh, 100 meters, and periodically they put in a plot. And this is very much like what is done in a, um, an experiment done in ESM 303. Transects will be laid out, and you randomly you come up with a random number generator, and you put plots along the way. Uh, I'm going to come back to this in a second, talk about stratified transects. There's other things you could do. You could count every plant, for instance, that touches your line. You could go out a certain way and then come over a certain distance. You could measure distance between an organism and your line. There's lots of different ways, but basically a transect is just a line set up uh, um, along which samples are taken. Okay. Um, Transect sampling is often, although not always, used in conjunction with stratification. And I want to mention this word because for me it was always a scary word and hard, it didn't stick in my mind. And if you felt that way, I just want to clear it up for you. <clears throat> uh, so sometimes you'll set up a transect not in a homogeneous uh, population, set up in a random direction. You orient it to go across some perceived gradient. So in this case, it's a hill that goes from low to high. And so it's going across this. So the conditions down here might be presumed to be different from the conditions up here. And so um, the way the statisticians deal with this is they say, look, we're going to take a third of this. This lower third is going to be one group. And we'll randomly sample along this one group of the transect. We'll do the same for the middle and we'll do the same for the top. And that's called stratification. Stratification means layering. So you run a transect across something, then you divide the transect into layers, then you group your samples in each layer for analysis. I'm not going to go into that in much more detail. Just so you know, a transect is a line going across. Sometimes transects are broken up into blocks, and that's called stratification. I just want to return to this in a bit because they're making me nervous the way they're presenting this because they did indeed have random sampling here. That's nice. And let's just assume they did it in a way that's replicable. But what is the third thing you're supposed to do in sampling? You're supposed to do repeated measures. And it looks like they have repeated measures across these transects, but they put in these little lines here, which suggests there's some kind of stratification going on. And within each stratum or each area, within each block, there's only one sample. So that gives me the heebity jeebities and I am worried about their, their, their sample. And I'm going to leave it behind because I have no idea what they actually did. It's from, oh, I should have referenced it. It's from uh, some Michigan worms. Uh, they're measuring worms, I think. Earthworms around like Michigan. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. It's funny though. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so what do we got? We got quadrat based sampling, which includes a transect. Another approach are point counts. So sometimes you just can't put quadrats down and get anything in it because the birds all fly away. So there's a variety of methods that base counts on randomly distributed points, not randomly distributed uh, um, quadrats. Examples, bird counts, pitfall traps, wildlife cameras. It's going to show you something of each. Regarding bird counts, now, first of all, I couldn't resist. I did a search on bird watchers and up jumped the picture of Christian Cooper. Christian Cooper is a bird watcher, so he's related to this. So I'll talk about how bird watchers do bird counts. But first, I want to say Christian Cooper is this guy who uh, was in New York City. He's a bird watcher, and this woman had her dog off the leash, and dogs are supposed to be on the leash. I don't know if the dog was hassling him, probably. It was chasing the birds away, which I don't know why, but he asked her to please put her dog back on the leash. He's African American. She's a white woman. She got all aggro on him for asking her to obey the law and put her dog on a leash and started yelling at him and um, saying she's going to call the cops on him, saying that he assaulted her. And he's recording this on his phone phone. And so he then puts, puts this out and it's, you know, just imagine, you know, in a day when there's not cell phones and social media, when a white woman starts yelling that a black man is attacking her, what has frequently been the result of that? Uh, and so that got an awful lot of attention 
in the media, on social media. Christian Cooper's a pretty cool guy, I think, and he's a birder. All right, let's get back to birding. So bird counts. Um, you can't put quadrats down and think that birds are going to hop into it. So what you can do instead is uh, set up some randomly distributed plots and you go randomly distributed points, go to that point, sit there and do your bird watching and count your birds. Um, pitfall traps um, are often used for invertebrates like beetles. And it's sad. <laughs> you dig a little trap for them and, you, and they, they bumble across the land. You might even put an attractant in there and they bumble up across and they fall in. And now you can count how many critters fell into your trap. Wildlife cameras, I'll show you in a sec. These point counts, by the way, probably are not going to give you a population estimate. What they might be able to do is give you an index of the true population. And I'll talk about what that means in a second, but first I want to show you an example of a wildlife camera. Because you can take, wildlife cameras are really great. Um, they're motion sensitive, so the batteries last a long time. Something moves in front of it, it turns on, starts taking video maybe, or photographs. Um, they can illuminate with, I think, a, a infrared light, which is invisible to the animals, so animals don't realize they, they have a spotlight on them. And you might get something that looks like this. That's a coyote. The coyote is cooperating with a badger. Isn't that the cutest little thing? What's going on here? Both of them are predators. Hey, go ahead and play. Both of them are predators and um, they're both hungry. And it turns out sometimes they cooperate. How do they do that? Badgers are super good diggers and coyotes will, um, I don't know, like they how badgers benefit from their 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 uh, relationship with coyotes, but probably I don't know. Maybe the coyote will give them a a gopher too. Anyway, both of them are hungry. This guy is saying, "Come on, man, I'm hungry. Let's go. Come on, I know where they are. We'll dig them up. You dig them, I'll chomp them." Okay, uh, so. That, there's a wildlife camera out there that captures this kind of stuff. And so you set it out there, you get it up, you can get a count for the number of critters that come by your camera during that time period. Maybe do some math or find a Humboldt Martin. Okay. I wanted to talk something about mark recapture for mobile creatures. It's a really cool sampling method. Basically, you go out and you gather up a bunch of, of critters and you mark them somehow. How do you mark them? I'm going to show you that in a second, some examples. But then you mark them, then you release them. And then they go about their life, hopefully not too traumatized by your marking. And under certain assumptions, for instance, um, complete mixing, uh, no emigration, no immigration, no mortality. Um, you do let, give some, let some time go by, and then you sample again. Then you count how many of your new sample carries a mark and how many doesn't. And then you can do some math and develop a population estimate. Here's some examples. So given various assumptions, the percent recapture, the percent recapture after release can yield an estimate of population size. Pretty cool. It's really fun. I've done it. I'll tell you about that in a second. <laughs> I'm going to do this someday because I have snails in my garden and I, I want to take some nail polish and just paint stuff on my snails and then release them and come back and see if I see them again. Um, birds can be caught, captured and marked with, with bird bands and look for those when you see birds because a lot of times they'll, well, sometimes you'll see a bird band on them. Also, if you find a dead bird and you see that band, take that band off and look at it. The, the researcher who put that on the bird wants to know where and when that bird died. I found these and you send them in and they often send you a report back, say, hey, you know that bird you found? It was born in, in, in the years such and such and it was marked over here. And now you know something about that bird, even though it's dead. I don't know what this is. Looks like a coyote, no, a hyena or something. And ooh, looks like these guys are um, having sexy time and they have been marked too. I didn't know you could do that to damselflies, which I think these are. Anyway, you can mark them, let them go, do a recapture. The percent recapture after release can give you an estimate of population size. Tricky, tricky statistics and wildlife people. They come up with cool ways to figure out population size. Oh, I know. I wanted to tell you that I've done this. I've done this with a very um, um, rare toad. <laughs> it 
this toad lives only on a couple of springs in the middle of a desert. And uh, it was one of the last uh, publications I ever published back when I was an active publisher. And um, I just checked in on it when I cr created this video, doing the research for this video. Um, and now there's this thing called Google, and it, has, uh, it tells you how often your papers have been cited. And so the more your papers are cited, the, you know, the more popular they are. And I went and checked, it was like 20 years ago. It's had nine citations, but it's, it was a super, super cool thing. You should Google it. Google John Murphy. That's my real name. John Murphy, Black Toad, Deep Springs, and you'll come up with it. And maybe you'll cite it in one of your papers and my popularity will go up. It's a pretty cool paper, even if I only got cited nine times. Okay, and I did a mark recapture of toads. And what we did is we had transponders, little tiny lozenges. They're about a tenth the size of uh, a little capsule you might take for, a, I don't know, a cold or something like that. It's really small. And we poked the skin on the toad and we slipped it in. Apparently it stayed there. We let them go. And then we came back later and then we captured toads and we put a magic wand over the toads. And if a transponder was in them there, it beeped and it told us, who our toad was, you know, where it was, had been marked. And we did mark recapture and came up with a population estimate for that very rare black toad of Deep Springs Valley. Enough about me. Okay, look, sometimes you can't get good enough data for a population census or a population estimate. You just can't because the critters are too hard to study. They don't like you, they hide. So a common approach instead is to develop what's called a population index, plural population indices, singular population index, an index of the population. What that means is it's a count that is related to the population size, but it's not a direct measure of population size. It's related to it, but it doesn't really tell you what the true population is. I don't write this down here. so write this down in your head or on your piece of paper. The utility of a population index is to determine whether population is changing in size. So if this is my index, every year I get this much number of the population from methods I'm gonna tell you in a second. Next year, I got more. Next year, I got more less. So my population is either going up or it's going down from what it was. I don't know what it is, but I know it's changing, okay? So it's really useful. Here's some examples. Well, there's two categories of population indices. One is a direct count and the other is an indirect count. I'll tell you what the direct counts are first. Um, some direct counts are a relevé. Um, a relevé is basically quadrat sampling, but instead of counting the individuals, you count the percent cover of your quadrat. So this quadrat has 98% cover of moss, species of moss. This quadrat has only 10% cover. That's called relevé. Um, a lot of commercial fishing boats are required to have fish observers on them, hired by, for instance, I don't know, the fish and wildlife people, government entities. And these guys will be observing the catch. Now, a commercial fisher fishing boat will be wanting marketable species. They want, I don't know, haddock or flounder or salmon or something like that. But there's always this bycatch. And it's an opportunity to learn more about the diversity of species and their populations in the ocean or wherever they're catching them. So they'll go out there and they'll make their counts. Those are point counts. Uh, those are direct counts. Um, the number of creatures that are caught are not, a, are not able to, probably not able to help you with a direct estimate or an estimate of the population, but they develop an index. We keep getting a certain number of turtles um, and uh, that number is going up, that number is going down. Pitfall traps I talked about, you know, things that fall into your cup, you know, that's not going to, you can't really relate that to an area and do math to figure out how many are in the population, but you can sort of get a sense of abundance or rarity or change over time. Um, bird and bat mist nets, um, these, these things that fly, you can get a, it's called a mist net. It's this big net. It's very fine and the critters can't see it. So that you stretch it out between trees or poles or whatever, and, um, uh, leave it out for a certain length of time in the same location year after year. And you can get a count of how many things run into it. And it gives you an index of that 
population. And I already talked about wildlife camera counts. You could set a wildlife camera up. They did it in a culvert, knowing that that culvert was frequented by wildlife. You could do it in a pass, a place where you expect wildlife to come by. You get counts. That count is related to the population size. Okay, an index. Now, indirect um, counts, here's some examples of indirect counts. Scat counts, like you could just like keep seeing how much, this is coyote poop, how much coyote poop, or you could use tracks, or you could use abandoned bird's nest. Over here is scratch trees. So um, animals leave signs behind. Those signs can be used as an index for the populations, but not a count of the population itself. You know they're there, or if it, you don't see these, then you, they're probably not there. <clears throat> okay, I'm mostly done. There's two summary slides here. I'm not going to read over this for you because you can pause the video and read it yourself. It's also available to you on PDH, and I'm done. But this, this summarizes the important parts, the most important parts, I think, of this lecture. Okay, um, lastly, it's not, again, I reiterate, this is not a complete in-depth uh, um, presentation of sampling methods. I just hope to give you some taste of the flavor of the diversity of sampling methods as well as, you know, some real facts about how it's done. Okay, background is in uh, just above Baños in Ecuador. I went there once, saw this beautiful picture, made me think about statistics and counting stuff. All right, y'all take care. See you around. Bye.